Thank you so much, Director Seller. It's, uh, this was quite uh, enlightening and, and exciting to, to hear and see. And I think it's a, it's a great start uh, uh, together with uh, Dr. Uh, Warner's presentation for our symposium. We have a few questions and I think um, we're gonna allow folks to, to unmute and, and raise your hand uh, if you wanna ask one live question. Um, uh, as, as we go along. Uh, we have a couple to start and um, uh, maybe in the interest of time right now, we'll, we'll just ask them, say, say who posed the question, but feel free to unmute and, and follow up. And um, I uh, will start with one question from Lisa Hendrickson's, uh, Lisa Hendrickson's, and uh, that's for uh, Director Seller. Um, and the question is, how are disparities being modeled in the analysis uh, of what was described as a net benefit calculation? Um, technically, I think it's done by weighting. Um, so we, we try to account for disparate uh, impacts um, through the, the, the weighting process. I defer to the experts to, uh, to go into more detail on that. But um, we are always trying to uh, account for uh, disparities that, uh, that, that are out there. Um, as, a, as, as the policymaker, I am... Um, I am always mindful when it comes to combusted products, especially about who the remaining smoker is. Because when we talk about population level adult smoking rates, it masks obviously what's going on um, at a subpopulation level. So for example, we, we all pat ourselves on the back to say we have historically low adult smoking rates. But um, the most recent data that I saw showed that um, if you have a GED and all you have is a GED, the smoking rate in the GED population is 35%. The last time we had a national smoking rate of 35% was sometime around 1975 or 1976. Um, so depending upon how you slice and dice what's going on, especially with combusted tobacco use among subpopulations, we are always uh, mindful of the disproportionate impact that tobacco use um, is, is taking. A lot of people have said, what took you so long to announce the action on menthol and characterizing flavors uh, in cigars? But here we are, we've made the announcement, we're working on, on both proposed uh, product standards and actions like that, I think, can go a long way to a, a addressing the, the fundamental disparities that exist uh, when it comes to uh, the health equity issues surrounding especially combustible tobacco use. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, chip in with a question for Ken, uh, but uh, Mitch, feel free to respond and maybe even Raphael. Um, so governments have developed reference standards, like there's a reference cigarette, and Ken teased the good idea of, uh, in my opinion, of developing a reference model or reference modeling parameter uh, for use in computational modeling uh, around tobacco regulatory policies. Uh, my question is, do any such model, uh, uh, like uh, reference parameters exist in other fields? And if so, is there interest in developing one for our field? As an example, I, I, I mostly see that the American Cancer Society's uh, CPS2 study generally uh, uh, gives you the relative risk of smoking. Um, is there anything else of comparable uh, weight that is being developed or interest in it? Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, values that could be selected, but we'd have to decide what we're going to do. We, we tend to use NHIS in our modeling when we're looking for smoking prevalence. We know smoking prevalence rates vary substantially from one major national survey to another. So that's an example of where one could decide to go with one versus the other, although it's not clear which is inherently the best one. Uh, the ACS uh, <clears throat> rates you were referring to are probably the best source of information that we have on that. Of course, those change over time. They have changed from one uh, CPS to another. Uh, so presumably you want the most recent of them. Uh, so I, I think the answer is yes, you could choose some of these, uh, but 
it would be a little bit challenging to get everybody on board as saying that's the right answer. And I'll give you a really good example. Smoking initiation. How do you define an initiation rate? In our model, David and I use the 18 to 24 year old smoking prevalence rate as initiation. That's how we define it. But lots of other people define it in very different ways and including you know, whether somebody has, is, is a current 30 day user of cigarettes uh, with the youth surveys. Uh, and there are all kinds of different approaches to, to measuring something like initiation. So I think it would be difficult to do that. Uh, it shouldn't be impossible. And some of the standards that you might want or referent values are not necessarily just quantitative uh, figures. You may want to have processes um, there have been some standards set up by economists for cost effectiveness analysis that describe how you should go about it rather than which specific numbers should be selected. So I think you want to think about both aspects. Thank you. Maybe um, we can, we can, uh, I mean, that's, that's a very good point. And I think we might come back to this uh, with, with a few other questions that, that might relate to that standards. And I think it is great to hear about, uh, or start having that discussion of standards of modeling, standards of data, maybe standards of how the, the data is used and what modeling is done. Um, let's follow with a, with a question from uh, Mike Cummings. Uh, it, this is for both, and he's asking if both of you could comment. Um, the epidemiology of smoking and premature mortality suggests that few youth who vape or smoke today will be experiencing adverse health outcomes before 2040. The real risk. Uh, oh, yeah, no. go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Yes. Yeah, Thank uh, you, Mike. I, I typed it incorrectly. Obviously, okay, very few young people are going to be experiencing premature mortality uh, by the year 2040. Uh, so the question really is the real risk to the population health appears to be in those who are smoking today and are 35 and older. So how might these dynamics be modeled since our current regulatory approach seems to be overweighted in those who are youth today with prevention and not really focused as much on the adult smokers who seem to be at greatest risk for experiencing severe uh, adverse effects from smoking today. So either Ken or Mitch, it'd be useful for you to comment. Well, I can offer something uh, to start with. Uh, the model that David Mendez and I use is, which makes projections out to let's say the year 2100, uh, specifically asks when we, the model asks, when will smokers die if they're going to die as a result of smoking? And it's got them by age, by smoking history, by how long they've quit smoking and so on. So any kid who starts smoking today, as you point out, is not subject to a risk of mortality from smoking until the age of 35, I think is the minimum age that we use. And realistically, of course, you're not looking at many deaths until you get further into middle age. So if you take those numbers and you add them up over time, the current smokers are subject to an immediate risk of death, uh, the current adult smokers and the young current smokers are not subject to a risk of death for many years hence. One of the things we have not done in our model most of the time, and I believe most models do not do, but it's probably uh, something we should all be thinking about, is discounting. Because a, we're counting a year of death that occurs to, let's say, a current teenager 40 years from now, a year of not being alive, the same as the, a year of uh, a 60-year-old dying today, and we're counting them identically. Uh, it's just that the kid's death occurs decades later. Um, and it, you know, and if from an economist's point of view, you should probably be discounting to uh, take account of the, the difference in time. But most models are taking account at least of when those risks occur. And as you say, we're, for adults, the risks are immediate. Uh, the benefits of quitting are immediate. Uh, the risks of serious illness or death from chronic diseases for the current kids who are experimenting with uh, smoking are 
you you said uh, what 20 30 years they could be you know 40 years off and mike i'll answer your question more from a policy perspective than from a sort of how to account for it technically in modeling um and let me answer it both you know short term and 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 long term and, and make one comment about uh, modeling projections from a policy perspective i think the most important thing and this is something that former Commissioner Gottlieb and I made clear when we announced the framework for the regulation of, of tobacco and nicotine now um, almost five years ago, uh, that, that in the short term, um, were we to have a nicotine reduction product standard in place, the, the, the brains of more than 30 million uh, smokers have been completely rewired by the cigarettes they were smoking. And the receptors in the brains obviously, obviously don't know from FDA and they don't know from the source of the nicotine. They're just seeking that next dose in the words of those old Philip Morris documents. So I think that, that we have a responsibility if, if that product standard is ever to be put into place to make sure that for the current smokers who can't quit, that there are alternative products made available to them with sufficient levels and doses of nicotine um, that are less harmful than uh, the, the product that a day may come where the product remains just as deadly and toxic, but it's no longer capable of creating or sustaining addiction. That's in the short term. The reason why that model was done out through the end of the century was to account for kids because 90% of all adult smokers started smoking when they were kids. And some of those older industry documents referred to young people as the replacement smokers for addicted adult smokers who died or quit. And it, it was important to, to, to see what the real impact of this policy would be over time to assess the generational effect. But it's stunning how quickly we would get down to a very low adult smoking rate. The public health return, return on investment from all those future generations of kids who will experiment with cigarettes, but won't become addicted um, yields this tremendous savings of healthcare costs avoided, but only much further down the road. And that's why we need to account for both what are we going to do now for current smokers and what's the potential for this policy um, to basically um, tr drastically reduce the number of those replacement smokers. Um, so, Mitch, this is sort of kicking off exactly that point uh, where you did point out in your presentation, no country yet has ever gone through with a nicotine standard. Um, New Zealand's kind of proposing it in a in a government act, in a government plan, um, but and that's you know about a, the equivalent of of an ANPRM. Um, how does the FDA go about updating uh, its uh, modeling, or how how should even more broad? Uh, those who are interested in influencing the FDA um, when real world evidence is uh, produced uh, after policies are put into place that may or may not look the same as what was predicted from expert elicitations. So I'm really thinking of graphic health warning labels here and thinking of menthol standards. How does expert elicitation uh, need to be held up uh, against uh, other kinds of uh, evidence? That's a really important question. Um, as regulators, um, we talk about changed circumstances. Um, and it is our job by law, but I would say there's a moral obligation and a public health imperative. If um, if, if circumstances have, have changed from either what, what we projected or what we expected, and we need to reconsider or reevaluate a policy based upon new information, new evidence, that's our job. Um, and we will, and, and, and we are voracious consumers of that information. So um, anyone who has new information for us after a policy has been put into place, whether it's one of those rules that I was talking about, or a time-limited marketing authorization for a claim, or a more open-ended marketing authorization for a new product. Um, we have the power to reconsider, and Congress gave us the power to withdraw PMTA authorizations, and they were so concerned about health claims for tobacco products 
that as I said, they're only time limited and the company needs to come back with a, a new application uh, to get an, a, another period of time uh, where they have uh, the, uh, the, 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 the authority to, uh, to continue to make the claim. So we are always in the business of receiving new information. The nicotine product standard remains something that is under discussion in this still very new administration. And when we announced menthol and cigar flavors in late April, uh, the only thing that we said publicly then, and the only thing that I can say publicly now is what the acting commissioner said then, which is discussions continue, it's under consideration. But that doesn't mean that um, the, the, the need for, for new information um, ends, even if uh, it is confirmatory of what we already know. Remember, extremely litigious industry, were a nicotine product standard ever to go final, um, who, who would want to bet that we wouldn't be sued, right? Uh, the likelihood that we will be sued is high. And these aren't jury trials. When we're sued, it starts with one federal district court judge. And that judge uh, has a responsibility under the Administrative Procedure Act um, to make an assessment about whether the final action that we took was or was not arbitrary and capricious. And what an arbitrary and capricious determination comes down to is the strength of the science. If the science really supports the, our, our use of the statutory tool that we were employing, whatever that tool is, then we have a really good chance of, of prevailing uh, in court, which takes me back to the question and, and the beginning of my answer, which is continue to give us new and more information. Help us make the administrative record for policies that have not yet gone into place as strong as they possibly can be, knowing the industry that we're dealing with and the likelihood that uh, we will see them in court. Thank you. There's, we, could, we could probably have like a two hour discussion. So um, in the interest of time, let's, let's move to, it's, it's a related question and I think it's very relevant for us modelers to really know where should we focus our efforts and, and, and think about uh, how we can contribute more to support the regulatory process. So, so this is from Jamie Tam uh, at Yale. And she asked, can you share any specific examples of how submitted comments have influenced decision-making and how the final written regulation reflects those comments? I guess this is for Director Sullivan. Well, let me talk about uh, product standards. And so this is more looking forward than, because um, uh, I want to talk specifically about modeling. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give some examples about comments, but not in the, not in the modeling setting. Um, you, you can expect that uh, the modeling that has been done um, on menthol um, is so relevant and germane to what we would propose uh, that it's, I'm not giving away any secret that you would expect us to be citing and relying on uh, the modeling that has been done to date uh, and any new information that, um, that, that comes into our hands between now and whenever the, that proposed uh, product standard either for menthol and cigarettes or characterizing flavors in cigars um, is published. Uh, for rules that are already on the books and the Center for Tobacco Products is still the baby center at FDA, so we don't actually have a lot of final rules, but there are two uh, very important, what we call foundational rules that uh, went final and displayed for one day before there was a change in administration. And then those rules were withdrawn by the new administration and we're in discussions with them about trying to republish them as final rules. And these are for the substantial equivalence and the pre-market tobacco product application pathway. And um, uh, whenever those rules do republish, you will be able to see in the what's called the preamble to the final rule. So that's all of the narrative that leads up to the actual codified language, which is the legal stuff that is binding and enforceable on industry. But the preamble is the rationale. And in those final rules, you will be able to see an extensive discussion of our responses to the major substantive comments and the degree to which the comments resulted in our reconsideration of some aspect of either of those rules that had been proposed and any changes that were made at when we went from proposed to final, uh, primarily as a result of what the commenters had to say. 
And you can see those kinds of discussions broadly in any FDA final rule. It is our obligation to review and to respond to the substantive comments. A lot of the comments that come in on, on tobacco product proposed rules are part of letter writing campaigns for or against whatever we have proposed. We read them all, uh, but uh, legally those don't have the same impact on us as a substantive comment, especially a substantive comment with new information that we were not previously aware of. And so in the preamble to the final rules, that's where you can see sometimes an extensive discussion of how we considered and to the degree that we had to grapple with any new information, did that both looking back to what we had proposed to see if we wanted to stick with what we proposed or made any changes as we went final. All right, so I think we're down to one or two more questions. Um, again, this one's for Mitch. Um, what can you say about the PMTAs for vaping products that are currently under review? This question is from Andy Highland. Uh, the NASA report in 2017 was clear that net population health impact from vaping products was dependent upon the extent to which, if any, uh, vaping products help move smokers away from cigarettes. Clearly, the FDA review of these PMTAs will shed new and vital information on this topic. What can you say at the moment? Uh, very little publicly because those applications are under scientific review as we speak. But but Andy's really put his um, his his finger on sort of like the the an important part of the evaluation that we will be doing on an application by application basis. What you heard Ken talk about the population level standard. What you heard me talk about the population level standard. And the the statute talks about likelihoods. That's why modeling is you know can be so helpful here. Uh, likelihoods to have both positive and negative impacts on both users and non-users of whatever product that we are that we are looking at. And that's where the, the, the net assessment, because it's not going to be all positive, it's not going to be all negative. It's going to be what's the, what are the expected positive and what are the expected negative impacts? And, and how do we balance that when we're reviewing each of these applications? And uh, Andy's exactly right. When it comes to population level uh, public health benefit, I don't want to single out any one criteria or, or factor, but the extent to which there is complete substitution of a less harmful product for a more harmful product is going to be one of the, the more compelling factors and considerations that we will be looking at and thinking about as we review each of these applications. Because that scientific review is underway, there's really nothing else that I can say. So maybe there, there's, I think these are related and maybe important to ask, uh, but um, so, so related to that industry applications, so the first question is, can the data and parameters used by the industry in their applications uh, be shared and accessed, let's say by us and others in the community so that those could be reviewed and replicated and of course, also to inform uh, non-industry modeling. Uh, relatedly, my comments ask, are companies required to make public their findings from post-market surveillance? Um, are they required to, to share that? Well, so let me take those uh, in order. Uh, and the, the first question really depends upon the type of application. So there, we've been talking about basically two types of applications. The marketing authorization applications, which is the PMTA, the pre-market tobacco product application, and then the claims applications, the modified risk tobacco product applications. For whatever reason, Congress chose to deal with public access to the contents of those applications differently. The PMTA applications are not publicly available. Now, if we were to hold an advisory committee meeting, there is information that would be made public both by the company um, and by FDA for purposes of a, of a public convening like that. But the law does not require FDA to disclose the contents of those applications. In fact, we have the obligation to safeguard the contents of those applications because it's commercially confidential uh, information that is obviously a, extremely valuable to each of the sponsors. By contrast, for the claims applications, the MRTP applications, Congress said, FDA, you must make those applications public. You must take those applications to your advisory committee. The only thing that gets redacted, as I said earlier, is, is truly commercially confidential information. So for the claims applications, yes, we, we make them public. 
Uh, and in the case of that, that Philip Morris International Altria um, uh, MRTP application for ICOS, it was a ginormous, uh, very technical term, number of files and pages that were made publicly available for, for all interested parties to see. So very different depending upon the type of application. We have made some PMTA authorizations for smokeless tobacco products, the heated tobacco products, and we authorized the PMTA for a very low nicotine cigarette. And in those cases, uh, what's called the technical project lead memo, um, a redacted version of sort of like the summary of all of the science is made publicly available. And we do communications to uh, the public to, to, sh to, to share those uh, results. But depending upon the application, either we, we are bound to not disclose or bound uh, to disclose. And on the, the, the second question about the reports that come in post-market, I'll have to get back to you on that because um, I'm actually not sure. I would assume that for PMTAs, the same rules apply and, and it's not publicly dispos uh, disclosable, but um, we will get back to you and give you a, a better and more definitive answer than that. So I think maybe, uh, so, so we don't get too, too far behind, we can, we can close uh, the session. Um, I mean, a couple of things. First, of course, thanking our speakers and, and really we appreciate um, your comments and, and your responses and really sets the stage for, for the next two days in a, in a great way. Um, I'll, I'll briefly mention, there were a couple of questions that we didn't talk and just generate themes. So, so we keep those in our mind for the rest of the symposium. So, so Ji and John from Michigan, for instance, she asked about ways that we could facilitate direct interactions and collaborations between regulators, decision makers, and modelers. Um, certainly that's been used for in cancer prevention. Um, there were questions about how COVID and, and the way that COVID uh, or, or decision making has been happening at the FDA and other levels with COVID in a much more rapid uh, way than, than I guess usual. And of course, how modeling has played a role there. If there are lessons there for, for us, for tobacco control, for tobacco regulatory science, for tobacco regulations, uh, to adapt some of this uh, uh, or, or lessons learned from, from the COVID pandemic into our field. Um, there was a question, I think, about um, from Alex but uh, if, if there is interest on, on measuring the impact that, that delays in implementation of those regulation is, 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 if that's something that would be helpful or desired. So we'll leave those there and, and, and ask those of course to our speakers, but more broadly and, and keep them in our mind as, as we engage in the, in the rest of the discussion. So uh, the last thing I wanted to say is I, I, we didn't say anything or make it formal uh, welcome, but uh, Alex Lieber, Assistant Professor Rajeshan was helping us with the, uh, I guess, uh, discussion and, and um, uh, right now. So, so thank you, Alex. Uh, great job. And well, so yes, thanks, uh, Ken and Mitch, and, and we really appreciate it. And we'll uh, take a five-minute break and reconvene at 1:50 uh, for the second session. So uh, thank you. We'll, well, thank you, and yeah, have a yeah. We'll see you again, and please come back at 150.